Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Rainbow Six Siege for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. What you're seeing here is the PC version. This is a tactical first-person shooter developed by Ubisoft Montreal and released in December of last year, and it was to a rather shaky launch. Most people seemed to enjoy it, but it was absolutely plagued with issues, mostly on the technical side of things, like, for example, some lag issues and hit detection problems, or issues with matchmaking, or most notably the fact that there basically wasn't any anti-cheat put into the game to begin with. So very quickly the game became flooded with cheaters and all of the goodwill it built up by actually being a pretty well received game despite its problems ended up kind of going by the wayside for a while. There was also a bit of controversy over the fact that there isn't really much of a single player mode in the game beyond the situations mode. But really it was those technical problems and the rampant cheating that people complained about the most on launch and throughout the game's life cycle really. Of course it's about 8 months after the game launched and it's had 3 major content patches since then so let's go ahead and take a look at this thing and find out if it's worth picking up now as opposed to how it was at launch. Well, as far as the presentation goes, it is neither the best looking nor the worst looking game out there. It's pretty average for the current console generation, and it does have some things that look fairly nice. The modeling is generally pretty well detailed. The environments have quite a lot of detail, actually, and particularly considering the amount of destruction that goes into them, it's pretty impressive. And the animations are generally pretty smooth and fluid. The problems come in with the texture quality, which is merely okay. It's not particularly high res, but it definitely gets the job done. And then of course there's the clipping issues you're going to run into all over the place, which are mildly annoying but certainly not deal breakers. Really the most annoying thing about the visuals is the anti-aliasing because there's a lot of different options available and they do impact performance pretty considerably if you want the best looking options for those. So in an attempt to get the most performance out of the game possible, I ended up with a combination of post-processing anti-aliasing that ended up making the game a little blurry, which is kind of annoying. They definitely could have optimized the game better, because even on a GTX 970 and an i7 4790K, I rarely get above 65 to 70 FPS. In fact, there's rather frequent drops down into the 40s, and I'm not really able to pinpoint exactly what's causing it. And that's mostly because it doesn't really stay in those lower frame rate ranges for more than a couple of seconds, so it just ends up being more of an annoyance than a deal-breaking issue, but it is still an issue. Then you move over to sound design, and that's where things get a bit shakier. The music in this game is really not very good. It's mostly a series of electronic mixes that don't really feel like they fit in very well with a Rainbow Six game, and there's no recognizable Rainbow Six theme either, which is kind of annoying. And once you get past that, you find that the sound effects are pretty inconsistent. The explosion sounds are pretty nice for the most part. They're pretty beefy. And then you get to the gun sounds, and only a few of them actually sound pretty beefy, which is odd considering the shotguns in this game are ludicrously powerful, but they don't really sound ludicrously powerful. But at least the voice acting is pretty well done, it's rather high quality and fits exactly with what they're trying to do, which is pretty much just nothing but battle chatter when you actually get into the game. And for that particular purpose, it works pretty well. Each character has their own specific voice and you can pretty easily tell them apart. Would have been nice to see that more in a dedicated single player mode that actually lets you explore the characters a bit better, but unfortunately we don't have that. And ultimately the presentation in general just ends up being something of a mixed bag. But of course what really matter here are the story, or rather lack thereof, because this game doesn't really have anything remotely resembling a single player campaign to actually have a story in, and the gameplay. And the storyline is, the shit has hit the fan so we need to reactivate Team Rainbow. That's about it, really. There is no single player campaign to have anything remotely resembling a story in, so what they have instead is a mode called Situations, which is just a bunch of non-connected single player missions that put you in a lone wolf scenario. And they're really little more than a glorified tutorial. You go into the situations and it gives you pretty much just an overview of different mechanics of the game that you'll need to know when you actually go into the online portion, and it's pretty lame, actually. About the only benefits you'll get out of the situations mode are a bit more of an examination of the actual game mechanics, which are easy enough to pick up when you go online anyway, and of course the renowned points that you'll get for actually completing the situations and completing all three objectives within a given situation. 
You can, of course, go back and redo these situations in order to get the rest of the renown that you might have missed, but ultimately, that's really the only major benefit to it. Thing is that there's plenty of ways to get renown. Just playing the game normally will get you a fair amount of renown. There's challenges you can complete, and of course you can watch the tutorials, and I highly recommend you do that, because if you watch the tutorial videos, you get basically free renown that you can then use to purchase your first operator. And more recently, they introduced challenges through Uplay if you're playing it on PC, and that allows you to get even more renown by just completing those extra challenges. Now you may be wondering why I'm starting out with the renown system, because it's basically just the in-game currency you use to purchase everything you need to purchase. And that's because it's actually incredibly important before you even go online in the first place. You see, you can select a bunch of different characters to play as in the online portion, and these are known as operators. You unlock operators by using renown points, and it starts out with 500 renown for the first unlock within a given uh, CTU, and it increases by 500 points for each subsequent operator. So you can get, for example, one through SAS, and it'll cost you 500, but then you go over to the GIGN, and all of a sudden it's costing you another 500 because you haven't unlocked anybody else in that particular segment yet. But eventually it'll take 2,000 renown points to unlock the final character within a given CTU. Now each of these operators has a different gadget that they can use to give the team an advantage. To give you a prime example, Rook is one of the defending operators and he can put down a bag of armor plates that will increase the armor value of whoever picks one up. And there's the attacking operator IQ who has a scanner that can be used to detect electronic devices. But those are only two examples out of the 20 operators available to you right from the get-go. That's 10 for each side, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and then of course there's also the recruit operator that you can choose to play if you don't have access to a given operator on a team, or you don't have any particular operator that you can play because somebody else took that slot first. Now the recruit operator isn't really at that much of a disadvantage, it's just that you don't really help out your team as much because the only gadgets you get are the universal ones, things like the deployable shields or barbed wire or or grenades or something like that. You also can't customize your weapons as a recruit, so it would behoove you to get access to an operator as soon as possible. Now with each new content update, they've also put in two new additional operators that are going for a way higher asking price in terms of renown points than the actual normal operators. It's actually 20,000 renown on launch for those particular characters, unless you have the season pass, in which case you just get instant access to them a week before everybody else. And that's really the main benefit of the Season Pass, because I don't really play this game enough to generate that much renown in a reasonable amount of time. In fact, it's not really a reasonable amount of time that you're ever going to generate that much renown. So it behooves you to just kind of play the living crap out of the game leading up to a new content patch. They definitely could have handled that a lot better. They have at least released all major content for free. It's included whether or not you own the season pass, and there is no segmentation of the player base as a result. So while they definitely could have handled it better, at least we're getting all of the maps and the operators included for free regardless of whether we own the season pass or not. Now all that said, once you get into the actual game, that's when things actually start to get pretty interesting because it is a tactical shooter and you have the attacking team versus the defending team. Unless, of course, you're playing the co-op mode, which they, for some baffling reason, decided to term as Tarot Hunt during the earlier parts of the development. Eventually, they wised up on that and actually just started calling it the same thing they've called it in the rest of the series. But anyway, the idea there is that your team is going up against a bunch of AI-controlled opponents for various objectives. And there's just the classic mode where you just try to eliminate them all. There's the hostage extraction mode, the disarm mode, and then the protect asset mode where you get to defend a civilian from attack from waves. And you can either go into the matchmaking for this, or you can just play it solo on three different difficulty settings. Now the thing is, the difficulty doesn't scale to whether or not you're lone wolfing it, so you do need to keep that in mind once you go in there, because if you go in on a harder difficulty setting, then it can actually kick your ass. The AI has a nasty habit of getting a lot of pinpoint shots in from a pretty far distance. But if you take it slow and you're methodical, then you should be able to deal with it. 
I guess slow and methodical is the name of the game anyway. At any rate, the actual co-op mode is fairly enjoyable. It does get tiring after a while, so you'll probably want to do a balance between the PvE and PvP modes. And a Rainbow Six game without some degree of co-op would just be complete sacrilege, so there is that. Now this leads me into the meat of the game, which is the PvP, the normal multiplayer gameplay, which is split into ranked and casual modes. And that's basically just determining how much renown you're going to get and what features are available to you. In the ranked mode, you need to be at least clearance rank 20, which is just level 20 in the game. And not only is it keeping track of your stats, which do reset with every single content patch that they're putting out, but you get the ability to choose your spawn location or defending location as well as be able to get an additional renown bonus. The only other major difference that you're going to see there is that the winning team actually needs to win two additional rounds compared to the casual mode, so it's a bit more involved, but it does have higher rewards. Now the thing is that up until very recently, it was absolutely plagued by cheaters, and then Ubisoft introduced a new anti-cheating measure called Battle Eye. That might sound familiar to you Arm players out there, but it's basically the same anti-cheat they use, and it has pretty much eliminated the cheating problem, at least as far as I can tell. It used to be practically impossible to get much of anything out of the ranked mode because of the sheer amount of cheating that went on with it, but now that the new anti-cheat measure was introduced, they actually have seem to eliminate that issue. Only time will tell, of course, but for now, it's doing a pretty damn good job. So kudos to Ubisoft for recognizing the problem and actually offering a solution rather than doing what they did with The Division, which is basically say, screw it, we don't care. And that is one thing I can definitely say about the Rainbow Six team, at least. They do a very good job of listening to the community and understanding what the real problems with the game are. Now, that's not to say that they instantly fix every issue that comes up in the game, but they do eventually get around to it. It did take quite a long time to get the anti-cheat implemented, but when it did get implemented, it worked rather well. Similarly, it took them a while to fix up some glitches and exploits that were in the various maps, as well as fix up the hit registration, which used to be much worse than it is now. It used to be commonplace to have a bunch of deaths that were complete BS from your perspective because you were looking at the kill cam and it looked like they weren't even shooting at you. But that was a result of the lag compensation and the way that the kill cam displayed, and they fixed up both of those issues fairly well. There are still a few issues with latency here and there, and there are still a few issues with the hit registration, but they're rather rare these days, so that's good. And they've also constantly been tweaking the balance of the game, so just about anything I complain about in terms of balancing could get fixed in the coming weeks or months. Although they still haven't really fixed up the semi-automatic shotguns, which are pretty ridiculously powerful right now. But I guess that's not really much of a complaint considering I tend to use those all the time. Anyway. Just something to keep in mind before I start delving into the game proper. Now, when you go into the online modes, when you choose either casual or ranked, you hop into the matchmaking and it will put you in a team of five players, at least to start with. Sometimes people disconnect. But anyway, it's 5v5 and what you end up having are three different modes. These are defusal, hostage extraction, and secure area. Now the objectives for each of these are pretty simple and straightforward. The defending team is obviously trying to prevent the attacking team from getting in there and doing what they need to do, and the attacking team is trying to get in there and complete the objective or eliminate the enemy team. In the defusal mode, the attacking team is trying to get to either site A or B and plant the defuser and defend it until it runs out on the timer. The hostage extraction mode is pretty straightforward. The attacking team needs to get in there and extract the hostage to the extraction point. And the secure area mode is there's a single objective and you need to hold it until you secure it. All the while, the defending team is trying to prevent this. Either they want the time to run out or they want to eliminate the enemy team. And to that end, they're able to put up various fortifications. They can reinforce walls so you can't just simply blast through them. They can put up barricades on doors and windows so people can't just instantly hop through them or shoot through them. At least not without breaking up the barricades first. And they can also put down various objects that will impede movement, like the barbed wire that will slow you down if you move through it. Or they can deploy shields that will protect from incoming fire. And the idea there is to get in the attacking team's way as much as possible and 
funnel them into a zone where they can be easily dispatched. Now the thing is, you can still get through those defenses as long as you're smart about it and as long as you have certain attributes on your team. For example, if the attacking team has a thermite on their team, it's one of the operators, then they can blast through the reinforced walls. Now before the round begins, you have a preparation phase and that's when the defending team is setting up their defenses and the attacking team has drones that they can use to scout out the enemy's defenses. It encourages a fairly slow and methodical, rather strategic style of play that we don't really see in the vast majority of shooters out there these days. And when everything's firing on all cylinders and you're working well together as a team, it is an absolute joy. Particularly considering you'll get those badass moments where you'll set up a distraction on one side of the map and then you'll go to the other side of the map and get ready to blast through and do your thing. And then you'll trigger the distraction, the enemy team is busy dealing with that, you blast through the wall and all of a sudden you just wiped out the entire enemy team in one fell swoop. That sort of thing is just immensely satisfying and it really does help that the game rewards precision greatly. Headshots are an instant kill, so that helps to remedy the issue of different characters having different levels of armor as well as the different weapons that you're using. So it means that that there is a degree of getting good at the game in order to be able to succeed no matter what you're using. It's not simply a matter of, oh hey, this person has this operator, therefore they're always going to win. Not necessarily. If you're careful and you know what you're doing, then you're able to use the environment to your advantage, you're able to set up flanking maneuvers, you're able to really just overcome everything that the game throws at you. For example, there was one aspect of the game that people were complaining about non-stop early on, and that was the use of shields, where people come in with ballistic shields on the attacking team, and they're rendered basically immune to being hit from the front. Well, the thing is, if you can't go through the shield, go around the shield, and people People learn that very quickly and instead of complaining about it they started realizing oh hey we can do all these different things and they started to learn different strategies for dealing with the different situations at hand and what you end up having now is a game that is rather well tuned the issues that were present during the earlier builds of the game that I played in earlier videos as well as the launch version of the game have mostly been remedied or at the very least mitigated and as the game's life cycle progresses, obviously we're getting more content, we're getting new operators, we're getting new maps. The only real issue is that we're not really getting new modes. Although maybe now that most of the major issues are fixed up, they can actually focus on doing that. And of course that does bring up the question of whether or not they'll introduce new modes later on down the line after I've made this review. I don't really have any way of knowing for sure, and that's kind of the danger of reviewing a game that is constantly being improved in that manner. I mean, the gameplay clips that you're seeing in this have been taken over the course of several months of play. You can compare things side by side and see how they've improved or changed over time, and it's pretty significant changes in a lot of spots. So it's entirely possible that if there's something I'm complaining about now, it could be fixed up pretty soon. But here's the thing, a review isn't about what could be, it's about what is. And what we have here, in its current state at least, on launch it was a mess, but right now, Rainbow Six Siege is finally well worth picking up. It's nowhere near perfect, don't get me wrong, and it's really not that much of a Rainbow Six game when you get down to it, but in this case, that doesn't really matter as much. It is a damn good multiplayer shooter that shows you pretty much exactly what we would hope destructible environments would bring to a game like this. We were worried it might just be a gimmick, but it turns out that they pretty much designed the entire game directly around destructible environments, and it works very, very well in the long run. There are still things they could improve. They could definitely improve the value proposition of the season pass beyond simply getting early access to the operators, although they definitely need to be very careful with that not to fall into the same pit that EA does with the Battlefield series where they cordon off a huge amount of content based on not owning a DLC. And I'm pretty sure they'd be able to do that. And of course they need to bring in new gameplay modes, and I would have liked it if there was an actual single player campaign as opposed to the pathetic excuse we have called situations, but it's a multiplayer focused game so I can kind of see where they would try to downplay single player aspects as much as they could. But all in all, I'd say if you were on the fence because of the various issues that the game had at launch, now's the time to start getting into it. I give it a 4 out of 5. Thanks for watching.